I decided to focus today on some new ideas around traces, aesthetics, and genesis, and really those are three things that I have found myself as an ethnographer of learning and somebody that does interaction analysis continuously returning to as sort of lenses for inquiry. And part of what I wanted to do today is answer for myself and think with you all about what these have to do with the larger project of building political and ethical perspectives on human learning. Um, so just to say a little bit about these three, uh, for me, traces refers to the ways we draw connections between macro-political processes and micro-interactions and everyday activity. So sort of how history, politics, and power shape everyday interactions. I'm also trained as a Vygotskian, so when I think about traces, I think about how we can see the traces of prior social relations in the skills and practices and ways of being that people develop. Um, that's also where my interest in microgenesis comes in. So I think a lot about the moment-to-moment -moment emergence of learning um, and how we can kind of track and trace learning over time and see it as it's emerging, not just um, in the form of particular outcomes. Um, lastly, I think that the learning sciences um, could use more of an attention to the aesthetics of learning. Um, for me, part, part of what that means is paying attention to the artful aspects of teaching and pedagogical mediation, as well as, and relatedly, trying to think about learning itself as an aesthetic experience. Um, and my own interest in the question of aesthetics really comes from being somebody that is trying to understand questions of educational justice and dignity. And part of what I think we need to do as a field is ask more about how learning feels to the people inside of the experience. Um, so this is just something at the edge of my own thinking. Um, so this is a little bit of a starting example uh, to exemplify what I'm talking about. This is an artful image that was created by a, a teaching artist who worked in this making and tinkering after school setting that you'll see me talk about more in a minute. Um, it was drawn from <coughs> video and it shows um, a student in the space learning how to lay down copper tape as part of a paper circuits activity. Um, and you can see the uh, educator who was working with her had both her hands on it at the beginning with one of the child's hands, then both of the child's hands and one of the educator's hands, and then you see the educator's hands kind of at rest while both of the child's hands are on the project. And I think it's a small kind of direct example of, of the genesis of learning, um, how it's socially mediated, and also an effort to, through an aesthetic kind of representation to think about how we can amplify um, what these forms of assistance might feel like for the people that are experiencing them. Um, so I'm going to talk more about this setting in a minute, but before I get there, I want to say more about how I'm thinking about political and ethical perspectives on learning. Um, so this is a quote that I typically have in my back pocket. Um, it's something that I return to a lot in my own thinking, and it's from Augusto Boal, who's a kind of the father of theater via press um, from Brazil. And he says, the smallest cells of social organization, the couple, the family, the neighborhood, etc., and equally the smallest incidents of our social life, an accident at the corner of the street, the checking of identity papers in the metro, a visit to the doctor, etc., contain all the moral and political values of a society, all its structures of domination and power, all its mechanisms of oppression. When we talk about a strictly individual case, we are also talking about the generality of similar cases and we are talking about the society in which that particular case can occur. Um, so, Boal is talking about how st social structures get reproduced um, within everyday interactions. Um, and drawing on this, I have also been uh, interested in studying the smallest cells of social organization that carry within them other possible worlds, and specifically to understand how learning environments um, that embody different kinds of relational and epistemic values uh, take shape and come to be. So another passage that I think helps to get at this is from Fred Erickson's talk in Social Theory, where he argues that social changes of a deeply rooted kind by their very nature involve alterations in the character of day-to-day -day social practices. Um, and I just want to say something about my own kind of family history and community history, because I think that's relevant to um, some of the sensibilities that I bring to this. Um, my family is from Iran. And our family story of migration and displacement um, really took shape around the 1979 revolution, which was um, an anti-imperialist and largely democratic social movement um, that my parents were a part of, that once it came into power, um, not unlike lots of revolutions, um, kind of created its own internal structures of repression um, and exiled and persecuted 
a lot of the people that had supported the revolution, including my father. Um, and so that history has made me sensitive to the need uh, for educational research and practice to pay attention not only to uh, critical analysis of social structures, but um, gra to grapple with the internal tensions and hierarchies of liberatory educational work, which is part of where this focus on the micro comes for me and part of why I think we need ethical as well as political perspectives on learning. Um, lots of people are thinking about this. So Power and Privilege in the Learning Sciences is a recent book. Angela Booker and Indigo Esmond um, have put out that really brings learning theory and critical social theory into conversation. Um, we did a piece in Cognition and Instruction after the election on the role of learning sciences in the new era of US nationalism. And Thomas Phillip, Megan Bang, and Cara Jackson did an editorial in Cognition and Instruction suggesting that we need greater attention not just to the what and how of learning, but questions like for whom and towards what ends. Um, historically, uh, and this is relevant to what I'll be talking about today, my own work has really been on um, trying to understand within the context of literacy, learning, and political education, um, how these kinds of larger questions take shape. And um, I have been often very drawn to pedagogical talk um, as a key place that we need to look to understand how learning environments feel to students, and also how these internal tensions of political education um, um, take shape. And if you stick me in an educational setting, my eyes and ears will be attuned to talk. I'm really drawn to that aspect of human interaction as a way to understand this. But recent studies that I've engaged in have sort of pushed me to look beyond talk and to try to understand the role of the body and embodied interaction, and also to understand the role of written feedback on student work as key kind of modalities of teaching through which these things take shape. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today is how I'm starting to see that. Okay, none of this comes out of nowhere. There's a history to this work within the learning sciences and within educational research more broadly. Um, I think that this is where we started as a field, trying to understand learning as a cognitive process. Um, many people are still doing really important work focusing on cognitive uh, models of thinking about learning. Um, over time, we have expanded to trying to understand these other aspects of learning. I come out of the sociocultural school. I'm a child of that tradition in many ways, and part of what I think many of us are arguing is that we also need political and ethical perspectives on learning. And I want to say something here about what that means for how some of the sociocultural theory might also get reframed and perhaps um, expanding some of its political implications. So uh, by way of definition, one of the um, approaches to learning that I uh, foreground in my work is uh, Barbara Rogoff and others have argued that learning is a mediated process of shifting participation in sociocultural activity, where experiences of shared practice become resources for new forms of participation. As people's participation transforms over time, they reshape and contribute to the activity itself. Um, one of the things this means to me is that when we look at any learning interaction, we can ask questions about social reproduction and resistance. And we can ask about to, in what ways does this learning environment or interaction contribute to reproducing or disrupting and perhaps changing the status quo. Um, I also think that um, this is an intergenerational view of learning as opposed to uh, adult-centered or purely child-centered view of learning, which is something I'll be talking about more. And in terms of microgenetic al analysis and my focus on kind of microgenesis, I think that drawing on this definition, as researchers of learning, we can look at shared practice or socially mediated practice and ask questions like, what happens further downstream from these relational experiences? And we can also look backward from um, the expression of skill and the expression of expertise and ask, how did this come to be? And I think those are both really useful questions um, to be asking. For me, definitions of learning are also closely tied to how we think about equity. Um, so Naila Nasir and others have argued that equity is not about offering or producing sameness, but about enabling youth to appropriate the repertoires they need in order to live the richest life possible and reach their full academic potential. And I think some of the political implications of this way of thinking about learning, trying to understand the relationship between learning and self-determination, and trying to conceptualize equity in ways that disentangle it from projects of assimilation. And I think these are useful ways from a learning theory perspective 
of trying to understand appropriation of practices, making something one's own, as opposed to simply internalizing practices um, that have existed in the past. Okay. Um, in this same vein, I think part of the work of developing political and ethical perspectives is to bring learning theory into greater conversation with critical <coughs> theory. So in that CNI piece, we argued that research on learning is deepened when the complexities of culture, race, identity, and power are treated as central to robust empirical analysis. So that's how we draw on critical social theory to study learning, but it's also bidirectional. So critical perspectives that highlight the reproductive and oppressive processes of schooling could offer a more agentive and complex portrait of human activity if they tended more closely to the cognitive, interactional, organizational, and relational dimensions of learning. Um, parallel to this development in the field, and in some ways in conversation, has been a methodological shift towards more participatory forms of design research. And that includes formative interventions from Engstrom, um, social design experiments that Chris Gutierrez has argued for, um, and community-based design research uh, that Megan Bang and others have been working on. And I sort of align myself methodologically here, and I just want to say a few things about key uh, values and kinds of principles from this set of traditions. Um, the first is that unlike top-down notions of design experimentation, these are really open systems that orient towards tension and contradiction as, as engines of change. So we don't shy away from complexity. Um, we kind of treat it as an organizing principle. Um, secondly, um, collaborative work is aimed at transforming social institutions and their relations, where people become more intentional historical actors. So collaboration across researchers and community partners, educators, um, young people, uh, I think ideally leads to interesting forms of praxis um, that allow people to use research to reflect deeply on practice um, and, and create more histor intentional historical actors. Um, Engstrom also argues that emergent positive models are identified from within the setting itself. And part of what this means to me is that um, solutions are locally defined um, and situated rather than kind of thinking about top-down models of change, which also, I think, pushes on, um, especially current, thank you, uh, models of scale, scaling, um, to really think about ecological validity um, and local conditions as opposed to one size it fits all kinds of educational solutions. Um, lastly, equity is treated as both ideal and pragmatic, um, a stance that requires close attention to the ways people work to imagine and engender possible futures in here and now activity. Part of what this means to me is that we don't confine ourselves to incremental reforms within the system, but that we also understand ourselves as responsible for making change in the here and now. Um, so I think there's kind of a social dream dimension to that more expansive way of thinking about equity work, um, but also an effort to kind of embody and enact that dream in the present, um, which is part of what I think a lot of this work is looking at. I've lost my mouse, there it is, okay. Um, so I'm gonna transition to sharing some work with that framing um, from the first study. And part of what I want to do is share how my focus on embodiment and the body came to be through this kind of collaborative research with young people um, and educators. Um, and I want to use this to offer one illustration of what it can look like to bring these larger political concerns um, into conversation with interactional analysis in particular. Um, so this context for this work is the Tinkering After School program which was a partnership between a, a science museum and boys and girls clubs serving black, Latinx, and Asian American communities um, in a large metropolitan area on the West Coast. Um, people are probably familiar with the growth in maker spaces and the maker movement. Um, in some ways, this was a part of that. The science museum was kind of a central hub for making as it started to emerge around 2006, 2007. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the tensions within that movement as well, but really there was an effort to do hands-on kind of um, STEAM-based activities within this space. Um, we did ethnographic work in this setting for three years, trying to really understand what it means to design for equity and what teaching and learning practices within this setting look like. Part of the reason for this, and this is a soapbox of mine if you know me, <laughs> um, is that I think the maker movement um, really interestingly shows the potential of a uh, desire for more progressive forms of learning and how they might scale really quickly, um, but also I think has not paid nearly enough attention to issues of pedagogy. Um, part of that is, uh, I think, part of a more narrow 
conceptualization of constructionism that hasn't paid enough attention to teaching, but what it means is we get you know, spaces with 3D printers in them and people go like, oh, that's equity, um, <laughs> as opposed to really thinking about the quality of the learning experiences within those spaces, which is part of where this work comes in. Another thing that's important to say here is that the teachers in these spaces were adults and young adults, um, high school students who were recruited from the uh, neighborhood and the communities that the Boys and Girls Clubs were in were part of the teaching staff, and that's going to be a little important in a moment um, to the story that I'm sharing. Okay, so methodologically we were gathering a bunch of ethnographic and international data, um, and what I wanted to say about our data collection and the analysis practices is that those ideas about participatory design research are not just about partnering in name, um, but about developing routine practices of joint activity where researchers and educators and young people can look at data together and try to make sense of what's happening within these spaces together. So some of our routine practices included um, ongoing video viewing sessions um, where we kind of engaged in interactional analysis with the folks that were within those interactions. Um, dialogic field notes, which was me basically writing field notes um, and then uh, sending them to the teaching staff and having each person had their own color and they would add their own comments within the field notes. So now we have these kind of rainbow field notes, but they are multi vocal in terms of the perspectives on the interactions. Um, and then using those practices to co design curriculum um, and co author kinds of research questions and quotes and analyses. Um, and part of what I want to say here is that. These routine practices allowed us to surface problems of practice in particular ways. And some of the problems of practice that emerged in this setting was that there was this kind of pendulum swing between more didactic adult-centered models of engaging with the kids and more child-centered models. And part of the reason that happened is we had young adults and we had adults who were novice educators within the space who came in and sometimes brought in um, more didactic models from schooling of how to engage with kids. That would quickly be kind of addressed. And then when it was addressed, like this is a different kind of space and we're trying to do these other kinds of things, they would feel really like I can't intervene at all. And it needs to be like totally hands off. So that's what I mean by the pendulum swing. Um, a related tension had to do with the way educators would sometimes take over for kids um, and do things for them in ways that I think overlooked opportunities for learning. Um, so to give you a quick example of this that helped me think about this in the field notes, there was a kid working with a, a teen facilitator um, on a project that um, involved some wire stripping. And the uh, teen facilitator um, in the video grabbed a wire stripper and kind of brought it over and started <coughs> to strip the wire for the kid. Um, and then put the wire stripper back. And then a minute or so later, the kid grabbed a random piece of wire that wasn't part of his project and the wire stripper and started to try to write. So it's like those little moments of like bringing kids into the task versus doing something for. So it was this idea of doing for versus with that I think concretizes the adult center child center binary that we were wrestling with. What's important about this is that particular kids would get projects taken over more than others. So we noticed from looking at the data that girls were more likely to have stuff done for them than with them. And the children that were uh, hyper-disciplined in their schools, that were seen in deficit returns by their schools, were also those that would typically in the after-school space have stuff done for them rather than with them. Um, and so subtle kinds of practices, but these larger macro-political processes were kind of taking shape. So we felt really concerned about this. Um, and in collaboration with the director of the program, we were asking ourselves questions like, how do we support educators to recognize these seemingly small moments as places to pause and bring children into the thinking and the making? And how can we support educators to see the ways various forms of assistance convey assumptions about children's intelligence and capability? Um, so that's really what led to this strand of work. So what did we do? One of the things we did is that we developed these professional development sessions that allowed us to look closely at rich forms of joint activity. And this is, I think, part of what Angus Room means by um, identifying positive models of practice from within the setting itself. Instead of saying, this is what you're doing wrong and we shouldn't be doing this, we identified moments where everybody on the teaching staff was engaging in more rich kinds of practices, highlighted those, and talked about why we thought they were rich practices collectively. So these are just a few examples. It's a little hard to see, but this is one of the team facilitators working with a student to solder. And she was nervous about the soldering iron because it's hot. 
So his hand is actually on her hand, bringing her hand in. So that is one kind of image of, of joint activity. Um, this is another similar image of uh, Meg, who is the director of the program, helping a student find the lever in the back of the sewing machine. What's important about this is that both of these things are things that the facilitator could have easily done for the kid, but instead they're bringing them into the practice and doing it with rather than doing for. What's also important about this methodologically is that even though video is really powerful, it's hard to see these things in video. So pictures actually allow us to pause and see things that might actually speed by really quickly within real-time activity. Um, we also were intentional about amplifying um, the generative practices of seasoned educators. So this was one of the um, older adults in the setting. This is something he would often do, clasp his hands, um, kind of making space for the students' hands within the workspace. We came eventually to talk about this as hands listening. Like, is there ways in which hands listen and maybe talk too much and take over space? Um, and this is another one that we talked about a lot, which was what happens when kids are eavesdropping or listening in when other kids are getting help, and how we can be privy to that and more intentional about like opening up the space so that kids can engage in that um, conversation as well. So I was actually surprised at how effective this was in the moment. Um, at least to get people to really be thinking about what these things look like. So um, one of the things you would hear in daily debriefs after doing these PDs was I had a cool hands and eyes moment and people would actually talk about other examples of interesting forms of collaborative activity that involved the body that showed up. Um, one of the uh, senior educators talked about it feeling like he, had, he was um, living an examined pedagogical life. And what I think is important about this, going back to the idea of praxis, across researchers and educators is that I think looking at the images and watching the video and some of the teachers talked about this had uh, in part an effect of slowing down interaction where they were when they were engaging with kids in real time again to be able to see things that maybe had zoomed by um, before. So what did this lead us to do? Uh, as researchers this led us to ask new questions. Like, which movements of hands, eyes, and voices were present, and how did they shift over time? And we used the word movements. We started with configurations, but configurations felt too static because these feel more like processes. Um, and so these are just examples of the range of, um, of forms of joint activity that we found within this space. For those of you who might be graduate students in the midst of data analysis, mm -hmm. these are the codes that we developed in the project to try to understand the phenomena that we were interested in. So I'm not going to go over all of them, but just looking at the left side, I do one part, you do the other. I start the task, you complete it. I do the task while you observe. I do the task while holding it at your eye level. I observe as you try something. And the I in these speaks to whoever is in the role of the educator in the moment. It's not necessarily adults or teens. Sometimes it was the kids helping each other. But we thought this was a helpful way to name them for um, educator audiences who might benefit from this type of typography. Um, this is a classic kind of zone of proximal development one, right? Like, we do the task together, then you do it on your own. This resonates with kind of like the I do, we do, you do model. What I think is important about this and why I wanted to highlight it is this is not the only rich way to engage in joint activity. This is one among wi many other ways um, to engage in that kind of collaboration. A few things I wanted to point out here is that we started to notice lines of contrast so a problem emerges, I try to figure it out first, versus a problem emerges and we co-investigate. And we notice from the data that um, educators that were new to the setting would often engage in the first one. And over time, this was part of the expertise that was developing for teachers, is like figuring out how to co-investigate with kids, even if they didn't know how to solve a problem or use a tool. Um, and then lastly, and this is what I'm going to focus on for the rest of this section, we started to notice some really interesting forms of microgenesis across the children. And one of them was that when kids were new to the space and an adult or a teen <coughs> hand entered their workspace, we'd notice the hands quickly pull away. And it was kind of a signal for us of um, the power dynamics or assumptions they were bringing in perhaps from other settings of what it means when an adult starts to work with you is that they're going to teach you, they're going to do it for you. Um, and then we noticed that kids that had been around for a long time, if an adult's hands entered their space, their hands stayed connected to the tools or, or activities. And then we actually started to notice the turning points. So there was often in kids' trajectories moments when their hands would pull away and somebody would say, no, keep your hands on it. 
And then the, from there forward, they would be more likely to keep their hands on the tool or the materials. Um, so this really led us to ask a different kind of question. If and how do relational histories mediate embodied interaction? And this is one of the things that as we've dug into the literature on embodiment and embodied cognition, I have noticed that is paid attention to less often. There's really rich accounts of scenes of learning where the body is central, but we don't often get a view of who these people are to each other and how they've been in engaging with one another within the relationship. Um, so to ask this question, we developed uh, an approach of kind of doing longitudinal microgenetic analysis, which takes forever. <laughs> I just have to say, we're still in the midst of this. But um, across our research team, we picked five children, um, two boys and three girls, and three distinct starting points within the three years that I was there for the program. Um, and each member of the team basically watched video for any time that this child showed up and tried to document what their interactions uh, were like within the, the moments that are documented, as well as in the field notes. Um, okay, let me skip that part. So a little bit more about digging into the literature on embodiment and embodied cognition. Um, so this is from uh, Goodwin and others who have argued that gesture is consequential to the organization of thinking and action and human interaction, and that participants other than the gesture are central to its organization. Um, again, not as much attention necessarily to the history of the relationships, although there's some important attention to, uh, exceptions to that. Uh, so this is uh, Gallagher who studies joint attention, and she says that sustained and repeated interactions build implicit relational knowledge and improve possibilities for greater fluency, flexibility, and further successful interactions, which I think relates to this idea of kids' hands pulling away versus them learning to keep their hands connected over time as a kind of implicit relational knowledge. Another way to think about this is as a kind of embodied shorthand that develops with people over time where the meanings of different action, act, actions change um, and become consequential to the way that learning unfolds. What I think is interesting about this is in my reading of the literature on embodiment and embodied cognition, there often tends to be this kind of positive flavor to understanding these processes where implicit relational knowledge is seen as something that makes activity more fluent and flexible and successful. But bringing kind of a political and power lens, we can imagine lots of implicit relational knowledge that reproduces structures of oppression and repression. Um, I think, you know, interactions with police is a really good one to think about how different bodies learn implicitly and explicitly how to engage with different um, people in different positions of power. Um, so this is part of where, what we're trying to do theoretically with this work, and I think this is a more concrete example of that earlier slide <coughs> of bringing learning theory into conversation with critical social theory. So we're reading about um, questions of axiology and ethics. Um, it's really small, I apologize for that. But trying to understand how um, people think about desirable or good forms of learning activity um, is one way to think about that. We're also really interested in questions of relationality. And I think in our field, um, often uh, learning scientists attend closely to subject-object relations, to use kind of chat language. Um, we also attend to subject-subject relations but usually insofar as subject-subject relations improve subject-object relations, meaning how social relations improve cognitive activity on particular tasks or within domains. Less often do we pay attention to subject-subject relations as a domain of learning, as a place where people are learning how to be in relation with one another, which is part of what we're thinking about in this um, project. Um, power and politics obviously is central to this. Um, black and brown bodies perform the additional mental work of navigating social meanings and assumptions tied to the various identities housed in their bodies. Um, some of the examples I gave earlier of kids that would have stuff taken out of their hands and what that means and what that conveys, I think is an example of that. Um, and then lastly, we've been trying to think about how to theorize these ideas around historicity. So from within the literature on embodied cognition, um, there's this argument that people create actions through the use and transformation of prior actions. And we're trying to bring that into conversation <coughs> with um, critical social theoretical understandings of traces as more along the lines of hauntings, which is an Avery Gordon term. I'm really trying to understand like the ghosts of history is how she talks about it. Um, how kind of more brutal social political processes and systems live in the present. 
Um, and part of what we're trying to do is pay attention to that alongside understanding how um, history, understanding history is not just about understanding the echoes of oppressive systems, it's also about understanding the echoes of liberatory actions and how those can also live on over time within present activity. Okay, so what did we find? <laughs> Um, we're asking this question about relational histories in embodied interactions and trying to understand how these histories play a role in shaping future um, interactions among kids and um, among kids and educators. Um, and in studying these relational histories, we found that these various configurations that I showed a moment ago, I do one part, you do the other, I narrate while doing the task, were not only present, but that they traveled within and across the interactions meaning that they not only appeared, but that they were taken up by kids within and beyond these interactions to support one another's learning. So this has led us to see that we need to be paying attention to these embodied learning interactions on at least two levels. The first level is analyzing how various forms of embodied assistance offered to children position them as competent and respected thinkers and contributors to the activity or not. Right, or diminish their sense of being competent or respected thinkers within the activity. That's the first level. The second level is understanding how students who are experiencing these various forms of assistance were themselves attuning to that help as not only a source of help for them, but as something they might use in offering their friend support. And that's what I want to talk about here. And that's where I think the ethical partially comes in. I think they were engaged in various forms of ethical deliberation as they figured out how to help each other with these kinds of activities. The way that we're trying to describe this um, is as embodied pathways. So we're thinking about embodied pathways as courses of possible action involving participants' voices and bodies that both represent and open up different kinds of social, ethical, and intellectual relations. We argue that the felt experience of salient instances of embodied assistance leaves an impression within the collective history and memory of the setting creating resources for possible action in the future. So what I'm going to do now is share an example of this. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background, um, this is two seven-year-old girls, Stephanie and Shauna, um, both girls of color, um, friends from school and in the Boys and Girls Club where the uh, program was taking place. So there's a level of kind of trust and history between them. Um, the activity was to create a pinball machine, so students had this wood and they were creating their own pinball machines and eventually they created an arcade where family and friends came to play their machines. Um, and these two girls actually were the only people that decided to create a machine together and they took two boards and they put them together and they made what they called a double board. Um, and the interaction that we're going to see is they're sitting at their double board and they're working with Meg, who is the lead educator, to hot glue different blocks down to kind of create obstacles and touch points for the pinball as it would get launched onto their board. Um, so Stephanie's on the right, as you'll see in a moment, and Shauna is on the left. Shauna is very nervous about the hot glue gun. <laughs> she's not interested in using it. She's worried about getting burned. She may have gotten burned before, and that's kind of a key um, point of drama within the interaction that we're going to see. And I'm going to stop it as we go along and point out particular embodied um, movements that are present in the interaction. Is your brother? Yeah. Hi, Hi Mom. I'm cheating. Okay, where do you want to come from? Um, so, so Shauna right from the beginning says, I'm not going to do the hot glue, right? Um, and Stephanie kind of is more comfortable and interested in doing the hot glue. And one of, what I want to point out here is that Stephanie hands come forward with the block. Meg hands comes forward with the hot glue gun. Meg did not say, bring the block forward. It wasn't choreographed in that way. It was just something that kind of organically happened. But she's one of the people that when she first came in the setting, and she would move her hands away real quick when an adult's hands came in. And this is her fifth day in the program. And on the third day in the program, she was unscrewing something. And the educator said to put her hand on her hand so she would get the experience of unscrewing. So there's a history from our view of this kind of organic moment of her hand coming in with the block um, to get the hot glue onto it. <laughs> Yeah. 
be Shauna's turn. She makes it really clear. I'm not ready for that yet. Um, and then Stephanie um, does consult with her about where to put the block. So it's like her first move to kind of bring her into the decision making, even though she's not gluing. Um, and then there's this kind of shift from Stephanie doing one part, holding the block while we make hot glue, to now taking the hot glue gun and doing both parts of the activity. Stephanie's concerned and asks Shauna if she's nervous a few times. Um, and then she starts to encourage her to do the piece that she had just done. And what's interesting about this, that helps us think about Meg's assistance as a source of um, a resource for Stephanie thinking about how to assist her friend, is that even though she had just done both parts of it, she doesn't suggest to Shauna that she do both parts of it. She goes back to just holding the block and is like suggesting that she hold the block um, while Meg put down the glue. And also, I'm here watching you follow me. Do you want, where do you want the glue to go? Which side do you want to go? Which side do you want to go? Okay. Okay. Um, so she takes the block from Stephanie, but then doesn't want to do that piece of holding it while Meg glues. So pretty immediately, Meg creates this alternate route of putting it on the ground and having her put the hot glue on it on the ground so that she doesn't have to worry about getting burned. After Meg put the glue on the uh, block, Shauna still hesitated to pick it up, but Stephanie was not taking no for an answer. And I think what's important about that is that knowing Meg and talking to her about this, like she was ready to do it for her or have Stephanie do it. She wasn't going to push Shauna past the point of her comfort, but a friend is like, come on, let's, you can do it. And so she kind of gives her the block and, and then you see her kind of pat her on the back when she, when she decides to take it. And then Stephanie moves on to kind of more confidently doing both parts of the task. <laughs> So this time there's less hesitation and now Sean is part of the turn taking and she hands her the block and, and Meg puts on the glue and suggests that Stephanie may have been correct in calculating that she was like about to cross that threshold and encouraging her to do so. Okay, so that she's not ready for, right? And she's really adamant about, I don't want to hold the glue gun. Um, what I think is interesting about this is that Stephanie says, just hold the handle. And thinking back to the way that Meg had put the block on the ground to create kind of a more low stakes entry point, we might also see that as reflecting her paying attention to these other ways of encouraging somebody to do something. Um, so I just want to say a little bit about what this uh, shows. 
So looking across the interaction as a whole, we see that present interactions have multi-vectored and unanticipated temporal pathways. Individual moments of embodied assistance don't just influence what happens next, but can shape what happens further downstream in time. So in this first progression, um, Meg and Stephanie's initial I do one part, you do the other, um, became a resource for Stephanie to encourage Shauna to hold the block. And Stephanie's action in turn became a resource, a course of possible action, for Meg to hand Shauna the block a few moments later. Um, what I want to suggest here is that this reading reminds us that these uh, forms of embodied assistance are not just initiated by adults and then picked up by children. Um, noticing the ways adults retrace children's actions also opens up kind of a more democratized view of who engages in um, choreographing these forms of joint activity within the setting. I also want to go back to subject-object and subject-subject relations. So this one is a, a view of how Stephanie was becoming more expert in the task. She was moving from doing part of the task to doing both parts of the task and then doing the task more confidently. Um, but at the same time, she was also learning about how to engage in this form of pedagogical relation with her friend. So she may have been noticing how Meg created this more low stakes entry point for Shauna and tried to do so herself, even though Shauna continued to resist, by asking her to, look, um, to hold the glue gun. Um, so looking across the interaction, it is clear that Stephanie was not only participating as a recipient of assistance, but as a director of joint activity. This role involved her keen attention to the ways Meg was organizing learning for her, not only as relevant to the task, but as relevant to how she might engage with others. And we're arguing that on a small but significant uh, level, we might see in her deliberations and interventions how children make decisions about who they want to be in the world, what kind of thinker in this case, and what kind of friend. Um, and what I want to share with you is one other example from this uh, project, which looked at these kinds of forms of assistance across a much longer term trajectory. Um, so with this view of the ways kids are interpreting assistance as not just for them, but also as potentially resources for helping other people, we started to look across children's long-term trajectories and try to see how this took shape. Um, so the second example is from Tanya, who was a, a regular participant in the program. And this is a kind of graph, it's hard to read the actual um, words, but I'll explain them in a second, that looks at her um, forms of embodied assistance that she engaged in over the first year of being in the program. And we see lots of different um, kind of diverse forms of assistance that she received, but the colors also attune us to who is initiating the assistance. And the early ones are all initiated by others, usually adults or educators within the space helping her. And then there was this day on March 4th, which has all the forms of assistance, um, that involved an educator for the first time within the data, positioning Tanya as somebody that could teach others. So Tanya had been working with motors that whole day, and she had gained some expertise with motors. And there was a student, Aiden, who needed a turning point, um, because from that point forward, the darker boxes represent moments where she was initiating, offering help to others. And so what we're trying to see is how these moments of positioning students as also offering support um, may have shifted her trajectory within the space. Um, and I just want to give you a little bit of a sense of where she um, ended up within her third year. So here she was seven years old, um, and here she was nine years old. This is her third year in the program. And when we looked at her interactions with younger children, we found that she was engaging in these forms of pedagogical expertise and intentionality that were very similar to what the more seasoned educators were doing in the space. So this is her helping Zeta as they were making Zeta's costume. Um, Zeta was younger than her, and as Tanya wrapped the measuring tape around Zeta's waist, she narrated what she was doing. She said, we want to go by your waist. Um, and then a few moments later when they got up to go to the sewing machine, she said to Zeta, remember, remember the number 27. And we kind of saw these as examples of doing with rather than doing for that we noticed Tanya had picked up and was engaging in more expansively over time. This is another set of images of her working with Zeta at the sewing machine. And you can kind of see the intentionality around the way Tanya is positioning herself to be supporting but not taking over, to be kind of, even her, this reminded me of her arm with the clasp, reminded me of the teacher that had his hands clasped like this. Like it's clear that she's the one that's engaging directly with the tool. And then we also notice this moment um, that she organized where Zeta's 
foot was on the pedal, and she was doing the foot pedal part of the sewing machine, and Tanya was kind of guiding the material through. So even at that level of understanding, I do one part, you do the other, to give the child the experience um, as she's stepping into a more expert practice of using the sewing machine. Um, what's also interesting about this is that a few weeks later, we noticed a moment where Zeta was working with an older facilitator and kind of reorganized the kinds of assistance that the older facilitator was giving her. So she was working on circuit boards activity and she was trying to open the alligator clips. If anybody's done that with little kids, it's really hard to open the alligator clips. And um, the teen facilitator kind of brought her hands in and then we saw Zeta push her hand out and say, wait, wait because um, she was still kind of working at it. And so just thinking about how kids also can test and reorganize these forms of assistance and that how that might echo from other experiences that she may have had with Tanya would suggest that within the setting, adults are also learning from children about how to engage um, in these kinds of practices. Okay, so I want to conclude my discussion of this study um, by offering another way to think about embodied pathways um, using the metaphor of light painting. Um, light painting is a tinkering activity that we did in the space um, where you have these LED lights and a camera with a long exposure and people kind of make all kinds of shapes and then the camera captures the image and it comes through as one picture. Um, and what I want to suggest about this um, is that when you're watching people do light painting, it's really hard to see what the image that they're trying to create. It just looks like flailing of arms, but when the image comes through, you can kind of see what it was, maybe a star or um, uh, whatever it is that the person was trying to create. Um, and our analysis across these cases, it suggests that children were attuning to the movements of others, similar to the camera's long exposure. Um, Stephanie was at reading Meg's actions not only as a source of help for her, but as a potential re resource for how she might help other people. And Tanya was similarly attuning to the forms of assistance around her to develop her own kind of pedagogical expertise. Um, young children may be particularly adept at noticing and remembering these kinds of actions. Um, they have to figure out the social world, so they're really good at observing the people around them um, in ways that I think we're still trying to understand. Um, methodologically, uh, sociologist Avery Gordon's work suggests that understanding these phenomena requires a different way of seeing, one that is less mechanical, more willing to be surprised, to link imagination and critique, one that is more attuned to the task of conjuring up the appearances of something that is absent. Um, and Gordon and others have employed these lenses, I think, to understand um, the traces of history. And I think these cases help us see how the idea of historical traces can help us see kind of prefigurative activity. Um, concrete experiences of the possible that shape future actions in generative and I think ethically significant ways. Um, okay, so in the time I have left, I'm not going to get into the second study exhaustively, but I do want to give you a little bit of a sense of what we've been working on now, um, which is similar to looking at um, traces and aesthetics and genesis within um, the context of embodied learning. This second study that we're working on now has really pushed us to think about forms of assistance in the context of writing, um, and specifically around written feedback on students' writing. So we're analyzing how written feedback on student writing mediates the cultivation of social and intellectual relations among students and teachers, how it mediates students' subjective experiences of feedback as tied to questions of educational dignity. So that's one of the ties that binds is this view of trying to understand how pedagogical assistance has a subtext um, that has to do with messages about students' intelligence and capability. Um, and we're also trying to understand students' development as critical and creative scholarly writers, which is something that was emphasized within this space. Um, so this is a, a, the SESPI Leadership Institute, which is a summer program for incoming first-gen and low-income students um, who are coming into the School of Education. Um, we teach a kind of intensive culture and cognition course with a heavy emphasis on writing. And the way that we've been approaching writing is really to try to bring students into this process of creative scholarly writing, um, which troubles some of the ways that they might um, have been socialized into writing in high school around, you never use I, you do the five paragraph essay. We're really trying to bring them into university level writing, but also a critical form of university level writing. Um, so uh, the questions that we're asking here, what are the specific pedagogical qualities of written feedback on student writing in this setting? When and how do political and ethical values shape the feedback offered? 
and how did students experience this feedback? So we're looking at their writing, we're looking at the feedback, and we're also doing um, interviews with students about how they experience that feedback. And just to give you a little bit of a sense of this, some of the um, forms of feedback that we're noticing that were routine in this space was that feedback was typically saturated with subjunctive language. Um, what if might be perhaps consider if. So this is an example um, that somebody, uh, a comment that was on a student paper. Whenever you introduce a quote, one thing you may want to do in a sentence directly afterwards is unpack it a bit in your own words. And then an example, in this quote, Mike Rose is commenting on the potential for tools to help us in our learning process. I just want to point attention to the may want to, as opposed to one thing you should do. Um, so kind of opening up choice and agency for writers, I think, was a, a valued practice within the feedback. Pedagogical narratives routinely position students as engaging in a conversation with the authors. There was a big emphasis on treating the writers of the text that students were reading as thinkers that they were in a conversation with, rather than as omniscient people that we should kind of put on a pedestal. Which And oftentimes, I think, even for um, older students and folks, that's, that's something that we work on. Um, so these are just some examples of that. Um, this is from a paper where a student compared reading um, Ta-Nehisi Coates is Between the World and Me uh, as a black student in a predominantly white high school. She talked about what her experience was that way and then she talked about reading it in this course and, she, and the feedback was, do you think that not being treated as a token black student is related to Nasir's notion of psychological safety and belonging? So kind of effort to bring her experience into conversation with um, this paper that we read from Naila Nasir. Another example of this, Bogatsky uses language like imitation and collective activity. Do you think that you and your classmates are imitating one another? Are you complicating each other's unfinished ideas? I think this also relates to kind of the Freirian notion of reading the word in the world and of asking students to bring their life experiences into conversation with the authors and the text. Um, there was also an emphasis on uh, what Edward Said called textual reception and critique. So engaging with text on their own terms and trying to understand what the author was arguing as a way to also develop a critique and response to what the author was arguing. Um, so this is an example of that in the feedback. What do you think Cole is arguing here in your own words? And what are your own responses to his argument? And we saw that kind of feedback a lot. And then lastly, and maybe most importantly, I think there was an effort on the part of the educators in this space to have a kind of camaraderie with students as writers. Um, so in the beginning of the program, we ask students to talk about, we do a survey about writing, and we ask them to talk about their relationships with writing. And one of the students said in her survey, I do not usually think of myself as a writer because I do not necessarily enjoy writing all the time. I'm very critical of my writing, and I feel to be a writer you need certain skills. And the TA said, I know what you mean, writing can suck, but I definitely consider myself a writer even though I struggle at it 80% of the time. Judging from what you said about your commitment to mental health in the black community, which is something she talked about in the survey, it seems that you definitely have something to say. And in my opinion, having something to say is step one to being a writer, and step two is trying it again and again to find the words to say it. It's an ongoing learning process. Um, and I think there's a kind of breaking out of typical languages of feedback here to engage in a kind of conversation and camaraderie about what it means to be stepping into the shoes of identifying as a writer. Okay, so as a kind of way to bring this all together, what I'm going to do is share um, an example from a student essay and then an excerpt from an interview with that student about the experience of writing and of getting feedback in this space. Um, so uh, this is a student named Danny who identified as a Mexican and was transitioning between his first and second year um, in college. And in this essay, he wrote about his mother and her experience working in a meatpacking plant. And the larger prompt for this essay was that students had to interview an elder in their family or their community, and there was a couple different themes that they could explore with that elder. We had read Mike Rose's The Mind at Work, and a number of students decided to analyze the labor that that elder had engaged in throughout their life, and to try to think about the cognitive dimensions of that labor, which is a similar project to what Mike Rose does, and that's what Danny chose to do um, with his mother. Um, so I'm going to read the excerpt, and then I'm going to share the feedback that was given. So he's talking about an excerpt from an interview with his mom, and he says, this excerpt highlights two cognitive skills. One of them is the mathematics involved, and another is the concentration aspect. 
Rose touches on the mathematics involved in carpentry and the mind at work, noting that although the math was simple at face value, it turned out to be very complex. My mother focused on the arithmetic involved in counting product. However, she didn't mention other aspects of mathematics involved, such as the timing needed to work efficiently, especially considering the high speed of certain conveyor belts. Another task she mentioned was building boxes while the conveyor belt was in transition. This required a level of coordination between her body and her mind to both perfectly calculate how many boxes she could make in the time she had and flow through the building process itself. All of this mathematics took place within an intensely concentrated setting. While doing this, her mind couldn't wander off because she would lose count and sacrifice the quality of her work. Anyone who has tried meditating understands the difficulty of controlling one's thoughts. When Rose reflects on the commonplace, ordinary expressions of mind that enable the work of the world to get done, he cites basic mental processes like perception and memory. I believe concentration is another one of these simple but critical processes that my mother mastered. Um, so some of the feedback that the student was given was on this first sentence. Um, perhaps, instead, this excerpt highlights two cognitive skills, mathematics and concentration. And I just want to point out how that would feel if it didn't have the word perhaps. And I think that happens a lot on written feedback on student writing where people just correct or offer the right sentence that might clarify a particular sentence. And I think the perhaps and then a, a suggestion still offers it, but also leaves room for the student to maybe play with it or think about another way to clarify that sentence. Um, and then lastly, there was this comment, um, really powerful section here. I especially appreciate the way you connect mathematics and cognition and the parallel to Rose. And here I just wanted to point out that I especially appreciate as potentially positioning the educator as a reader, not just as a grader. And I think those are really different um, experiences to have when looking at feedback. Um, the last piece from his essay um, kind of brought Rose's thinking into conversation with the larger socio-political context of his mom's experience. So he said, because of the broader socio-political context, some workers had greater cognitive loads than others, namely those who had to actively think about their physical safety because of their immigration status. My mother, who was documented, did not have to work and simultaneously worry about whether immigration and customs enforcement would be waiting to deport her or whether she'd get to see her kids again. My mother did exhibit a role of resistance, however. Similar to how non-Jewish citizens would shelter Jewish persons during the Holocaust, my mother provided a safe vehicle, both literally and metaphorically, for undocumented immigrants to preserve their humanity and retain the basic human right to work. This situation proves to me Bruner's quote, learning and thinking are always situated in a cultural setting. The learning and thinking undocumented immigrants performed while working at this um, plant happened within the context of a political and cultural atmosphere <coughs> that aimed to deny them of their humanity. My mother's learning and thinking existed as a counterscript to that cultural atmosphere, affirming one's humanity and practicing solidarity. Um, and part of the feedback here was, yes, this is a powerful connection. And also the Nasir piece discusses this as tied to non-dominant youth. What might it open up to also consider adults, as you do here? And part of the move here was that we were working with students to think about what it meant to analyze their experiences using the text and what it meant to theorize back to the text using their experiences. So looking out for the ways that not only they could use the lenses of the text to look at these experiences, but the ways these experiences complicated the theory and needed to expand the theory, which was a way of positioning them as, as also theorists um, of these experiences. Um, so I'm going to play for you an excerpt of an interview with Danny, where he talks about writing this essay. It's a little bit longer, but I'm going to end the talk right after that. And I think there's a lot of rich interaction here, both about his experience as a writer, but I also think part of what I've been suggest suggesting about how ex assistance is experienced and tied to questions of educational dignity comes through in the exchange between him and the TA who was one of the TAs in the program, who was the one that was interviewing him in the context of the research. So in the interest of time, I'm going to stop it there. But there's just a few things I wanted to point out about what he shared about his experience writing this. So he talked about, kind of similar to what I was talking about earlier, about um, sources of help becoming ways that um, children helped each other. He talked about talking with his friend and how she helped him add the layers of analysis. Um, he talked about writing alongside the authors. Um, thinking about how that move of positioning students as in a conversation with the authors or writing alongside the authors might have been taken up. And he said, I was able to do something similar to Rose. We had just read Rose's 
paper on his mom as a waitress and looking at the cognitive dimensions of her work. Um, but I love that in that moment, he also doesn't kind of take Rose's project at face value. He also kind of pushes back and says, but what does it mean to validate my mom's thinking using this kind of way of thinking from academia? So he was wrestling with that in a way that I think is important. Um, and towards the end, this kind of um, a discussion of what we see as a kind of socio-political risk-taking and, and a form of becoming, where a little later in, the, in that clip, he talks about how he is on Twitter a lot and sees all these people taking these stances but never tweets and never says like actually what he thinks and that this was a moment for him of actually stepping out in that way. Um, and in a later moment in the interview, he described the experience of writing it as one where he was putting his ideas out there and having them hold their ground. Um, and part of what we're arguing is that in making the decision to draw the parallel between the experience of Jews in, in the Holocaust and the experience of undocumented immigrants in the U.S., he was engaging in the process of becoming in the sense that he stepped into this new, more public identity as a political thinker and a critic. And I just want to return to that Erickson passage from the beginning and say that I think this is part of those alterations in day-to-day -day practices that tie to broader forms of social change. Um, and I also want to suggest that he was stepping into a new role as a writer, because this is something writers worry about. Writers worry about something sounding grandiose, and I think he was wrestling with that in a way that writers wrestle with. Um, so I want to come back to aesthetics to end, um, and I'm really curious to hear people's thoughts, so I want to make sure to have time for that. Um, and I think there's a kind of poetics present in the ways that students narrate their learning experiences. And I think that it offers an important window into the deeper meanings those experiences hold for them um, <coughs> and what a growing sense of capability and agency feels like to the person. So earlier I said that I think learning sciences um, could engage in more of a conversation with critical social theory. I also think that we need the learning humanities, not just the learning sciences. Um, so. Uh, as researchers and educators invested in educational justice and questions of dignity, which part of how we're um, defining that is as the multifaceted sense of a person's value generated through substantive educational experiences that recognize and cultivate one's mind, humanity, and creative potential. We're interested in experiences of dignity, but we're also interested in the conditions that give rise to those experiences. And I think to really understand that, we need more of the aesthetic analysis uh, Maxine Green talks about these as aesthetic moments made by living persons for living persons. Um, and Jay Lemke argues that if affect, feeling, and emotion are essential to our accounts of how people live their lives, then, then are they not equally essential to how we present those accounts? Which I think is a push to take some license with our analysis and representation as aesthetically. Um, so part of what I'm arguing is that um, while pedagogical talk is central, we should also be closely attuning to the role of the body, and in this last case, to the role of written feedback on student work, as other modalities through which experiences of educational dignity and indignity take shape, and as resources for how students come to relate to one another. And I think that um, humanistic tools are going to be as essential um, as the more scientific tools that we have for understanding this. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Wow.